My body is mine. It does not belong to the state. It does not belong to the mosque. It does not belong to the church, the synagogue, or wherever else you worship. It does not belong to my family. It belongs to me. When the Egyptian revolution began on January 25th, 2011, women were out there on the street risking their lives against the state dictatorship of Hosni Mubarak. But women asked who owns our bodies when less than a month after Mubarak was toppled, the Egyptian military sexually violated at least 17 Egyptian women revolutionaries through so-called virginity tests. The military said that they subjected these women to basically two fingers stuck up their vaginal opening because they didn't want these women to accuse the military of raping them. In other words, only a virgin can be raped. My body is mine. Less than six months after those violations by the Egyptian military, a young Egyptian woman called Alia El Mahdi posed naked in her parents' living room and posted the picture of her nude body as a form of saying, my body is mine. There was more anger directed towards Alia El Mahdi than against the Egyptian military for sexually violating those revolutionaries. So who owns my body? I asked that question a month after Alia posed naked in her parents' bedroom. Now remember, she did not go out on the street and strip. This was in her parents' living room. Sorry, we'll get to the bedroom soon. So a month after Alia posed her picture and put it on her blog, I had to ask who owns my body when Egyptian riot police beat me, broke both my arms, and sexually assaulted me. I'm a writer, and both my arms were in casts for three months. So I was effectively paralyzed. I could actually use just one finger on a touchpad, but I couldn't write the way I usually do. And so in asking who owns my body, I promised myself to take ownership back of my body when my bones healed by dyeing my hair red, because for me, red is a fierce color, and it matches Ted. <laughs> and I also got two tattoos. I got a tattoo on my right forearm of the ancient Egyptian goddess Sekhmet. Now, Sekhmet is the goddess of retribution and sex, and I say yes, please, to both. <laughs> because what Sekhmet does is, first, she kicks your head in, then she fucks your brains out. <laughs> and on my left forearm, I have Arabic calligraphy to honor the name of the street where at least 40 people were killed and more than 300 injured. Muhammad Mahmoud, because that's the street where I was also assaulted. And under the name of Muhammad Mahmoud, I have in Arabic Horeya, which is the Arabic word for freedom, because we were liberated on that street. And I got those tattoos for two reasons. One, as a way of saying I survived and I own my body, because I have a scar. I had an operation on this arm to fix my broken bone. I'm very proud of that scar, and I will never cover it up but I wanted to make markings on my body of my own as a way of saying I own my body. But it was also to honor 12-year-old boys who went out onto Muhammad Mahmoud and who would write their mother's phone number on their forearm in case their bodies ended up in the morgue and no one knew who they were. So Sekhmet is my mother. Who owns my body? I'm an Egyptian-American, as you heard from my mad's kind introduction. When I'm in the United States, the question who owns my body is even more pressing these days because of the, coming, the forthcoming election. And we will see tomorrow during the GOP debate a row of men wanting to determine for women who owns our bodies. They are racist, they are bigoted, they, they are competing on who can shit on Muslims the most and who can control women's bodies the most. So who owns my body? My message to the fascist dictator in Egypt, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, and his rivals, the Muslim Brotherhood, is the same as my message to the Christian Brotherhood in the United States, represented by these GOP candidates. And it's the same message that I've been taking around the world to answer who owns my body. And my message to all of them, whether they're politicians or men of religion, because remember, my body is not owned by any of the places where you worship, my message to them all is, stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there.
Now, as an Egyptian, as an African, as a feminist, as a Muslim, as all the different hats that I wear together, I understand how difficult it is to talk about sex and vaginas, and often how difficult it can be to say fuck. Now, I'm a big fan of saying fuck. <laughs> a, because I'm an angry woman, and I love angry women, because angry women are free women. And B, because as women, we're raised to be nice and polite. And what has nice and polite ever got us? Fuck nice and polite. So I've been taking my message of fuck sex vagina around the world. Because I've written a book called Headscarves and Hymens, in which I examine all of these things that I'm talking about at length. It's called Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. Now, before any of you get comfortable and think that I wrote this book to make you sit there and be proud of how wonderful your life is compared to what life is like in the Middle East and North Africa, my book's me message and the mission of my book is, first of all, to make you angry, and second of all, to remind you that if it's shit over there, it's shit everywhere. There is misogyny around the world. There is no place on earth in which feminism has completely liberated women. So when I've taken my, my book and my, basically my fuck sex vagina tour around the world, when I'm in Scandinavia, where you know, we're told it's the paragon of feminism, I make them uncomfortable there by asking them, so this being the feminist heaven that it is, have you ended domestic violence? The question is, and the answer is no. Have you achieved political parity? The answer is no. And even though Scandinavia is this feminist paragon, it's now a taboo to call yourself feminist. Here in this country, in the UK, I ask the same questions, and I know that the answer is no to all of them. And in the United States, the answer is no to all of them, and we're fighting the Christian Brotherhood of the GOP, but there is something that gives me hope that I connect to the Egyptian revolution and that I connect to this global tour that I'm engaged in, the Fuck Sex Vagina Tour, and it's called Black Lives Matter. And the, reason, and the reason that Black Lives Matter makes me so excited is because it was founded by three black queer women. Now think about that. In today's world, to be a woman, to be black, and to be queer is to be on the intersection of everything that I'm fighting for. And those women, have managed to start what I believe is a revolution in the United States. Those women have changed the conversation and forced the, the recognition that it's not just by fighting misogyny alone and it's not just by fighting racism alone that the revolution will succeed, it's by fighting both. It's by fighting racism, misogyny, classism, homophobia, so much. So if my story began with the Egyptian revolution, my story has to go out into the world and connect with all the revolutions happening. So I look at China, where I'm just learning now about a group of women called the Feminist Five, who in the run-up to International Women's Day, March 8th, were arrested preemptively by Chinese police because they wanted to demonstrate against domestic violence and other forms of violence against women. The revolution in India is against many forms of violence against women, but we only became familiar with it after the Delhi bus gang rape. But there are women in India who for years have been fighting against violence against women. And there's a particular group of women that I'm especially in love with in India called the Pink Gulabi Gang. And these are women who wear pink saris and walk around with big sticks and beat the crap out of men <laughs> who attack women. And those are angry and free women because we all know now, I talk about street sexual harassment in Egypt because I myself, and as many women in Egypt, the majority of women in Egypt have formed one, have faced one form of violence on the street or another. But it is with great pride that I share with you a story from about five or six months ago when a man groped me and I turned around and started beating him. <laughs> and he actually had the nerve to say, but I didn't mean it. I'm like, what, my ass walked into your hand? <laughs> And as I was hitting this man, I realized how difficult it is as a woman to hit a man. We're not socialized to hit men. It's much easier for them to hit us. 
But the more I hit him and the more he cowered behind his bag, the more I was like, fuck this shit. Who is this guy who thinks he can grope my ass? And I, again, with great pride, share with you that he ran away. I made a man run away. So we need to clone this pink gulabi gang and just basically have them everywhere. And in Turkey and Afghanistan, Muslim majority countries, we've seen various forms of the revolutions there as well, when after horrific acts of violence that killed women, several women, too many to be named, we heard of reports of women joining funerals and going against conservative Islamic tradition by demanding the right to bury those women's bodies. In Turkey, they went so far as to tell the imam, we are not going home because women in, Islam, in, in conservative Islamic traditions can only join part of the funeral procession and then have to go home. But these women, and again in Turkey especially, they told the imam, we're not going home because no other man will touch her again. And this was as they were burying a victim of rape and murder. So we are seeing examples of women rising up across the world. And I mention them because as a feminist I know, and as, as a feminist from Egypt and from Africa, and a woman who identifies as Muslim, I know how difficult it is to stand on a stage and talk about feminism and to expose the misogyny of my own culture and my own faith because the first thing that I get asked is, don't you think you are giving ammunition to the racists, the xenophobes, the Islamophobes, etc., etc.? Now, the men who violate women's rights are never asked this. The men who grope me, the, men, the, the military who violated our revolutionary heroes, they're never asked, don't you think you're making Egyptians look bad? Don't you think you're making Muslim men look bad? It's the women who speak out. So what is it about speaking out? Why is speaking out so dangerous? Speaking out is so dangerous because as the black lesbian poet Audre Lorde reminded us, your silence will not protect you. We have to speak out. And in speaking out, what I try to do as that Egyptian, as that African, as that Muslim, as that feminist, is basically to say fuck you to everyone. Because I recognize that there is a right-wing, racist, xenophobic group of people there wanting to launch attacks on Muslim men using my words and they are not my allies. But I also recognize there's an internal misogynist wing that wants to silence me for the sake of making us look good, and they're not my friends either. But there's also a silent left wing around the world that practices cultural relativism and political correctness at my expense, at the expense of women across the world. And this I would hear from women again and again. Now, my book tour hasn't just taken me to white people land. I haven't just been going to Scandinavia and making white people feel good about their cultures, because as I said, I make them uncomfortable as well. But I was in India last month, and I was in Nigeria two weeks ago. Niger. I can't dance like I mad can, but you know, maybe tonight I'll try. <laughs> um, but you know, in India, in Nigeria, and I'm going to Pakistan in February, those conversations are especially essential. Because there, again, women stand on the intersection of racism, of misogyny, of homophobia. When I look at words like virgin and hymen that I, I, I mention again and again in my book, I recognize how harmful it has been for Christian right-wing groups from the United States to go to Africa and promote that message of the Christian Brotherhood and the damage that it has done to so many communities on the continent. When I was in Nigeria, one of the most exciting events that I attended, I was at the RK Arts and Book Festival, was a panel discussion on being LGBT in Africa. And there were two openly gay Nigerian writers on the stage. And it is dangerous to be openly gay in Nigeria, as many of you know, because of anti-homosexuality laws. Now, in Egypt, our current fascist dictator, Abdel Fattah Hassisi, has been on a witch hunt, a moral crusade against gay men, against atheists, against women dancers, against pop stars. All of those things are designed to make anyone who does not conform to that big strong man, the conservative man, anyone who doesn't conform, and, and we are bombarded from messages from within and from without. And the only way that we can fight against those messages and the only way that we can fight against the toxicity of hypermasculinity and religious fundamentalism is to speak out. Now, what happens when you speak out? One of the things I've done in my book, my book is mostly reportage, but I include some personal stories. And I include those personal stories because 
When, in the run-up to the Egyptian revolution, we would often say that we are breaking the barrier of fear by marching in the street when it's so dangerous to protest. In Egypt now, it's almost impossible to protest. But in the years running up to the 2011 revolution, as protesters, we would say we are breaking the barrier of fear. But that barrier of fear is against the state. The state is part of what I call the trifecta of misogyny. And that trifecta of misogyny is, again, something I take across the world. The trifecta of misogyny has on its three corners the state, the street, and the home. Because as I mentioned when I first began my talk, Egyptian women went out on the streets against that state alongside men. But what happened when we went home? We looked at the men that we share our homes with, and we realized that they, whether they are on the street corners or in our bedrooms, are part of that trifecta of misogyny because it's the state, the street, and the home that together oppress women. The state oppresses everyone, but the state, the street, and the home specifically oppress women. And so part of what I was trying to do in my book as a way of fighting that trifecta of misogyny is to break the barrier of silence and shame. And I do that by trying to share personal stories that we're normally discouraged from talking about. So I mentioned, for example, that I wore a headscarf for nine years, I chose to wear it, but it took me eight years to take it off. Why was it easier to wear a headscarf than to take it off? That's one of the things that I unpack in my book. I also share in my book that I waited until I was 29 to have sex, because that's how I was raised. That's how many of us, where I come from, and women from my cultural and faith background, that's how we're raised. So when I share those stories, and I get that personal, this is what happens. I was in Manchester, and a woman at my reading came during the signing, sat on the ground, desk level with me, and she said to me, I'm 32 and I still haven't had sex. And she said, what, how do you think I can get over the guilt? Do you think God will forgive me? Now these are real questions that so many women from where I come from, across the continent, not just in Egypt, are wrestling with. But who do they ask these questions? So, as Audrey Lord reminds us, your silence will not protect you. We have to break those barriers. And as the lesbian Chicana political thinker Gloria Anzaldúa said, I will not honor a culture that harms me in the name of protecting me. So I talk about those stories and I say, my body belongs to me. It does not belong to the state. It does not belong to any temple of worship. It does not belong to the street and it does not belong to my family because that statement in and of itself is the sexual revolution. Because when I say my body belongs to me, it becomes a revolutionary act to fight against female genital mutilation, which is a scourge against women in too many countries in, on the continent. In Egypt alone, between the age of 15 to 49, 91% of women have been subjected to genital cutting. 91%. And it is done as a way of controlling women's sexuality. So again, stay out of my vagina unless I want you in there. When I say my body belongs to me, it becomes a revolutionary act to fight against marital rape, which again, in too many countries on the continent, is not a crime. When I say my body belongs to me, it becomes a revolutionary act to say, once I began to have sex at the age of 29, I realized that sex, obviously, is a wonderful thing. And I realized that it is a revolutionary act to say it is my right as a woman to have sex with whoever I want, whenever I want, with their consent, obviously. <laughs> consent is a given. But here's the thing. I have sex with whoever I want and whenever I want, inside or outside of marriage, with a woman, with a man, with many women, with many men, in whatever form I choose. Because one of the things that I determined to do is to make those words virgin and hymen obsolete. What is virginity unless a penis and a vagina are involved? What if I don't want a penis? What if there are two penises involved? How then do we determine virginity? And virginity also perpetuates this idea that sex is something that women give and that men take. I'm not giving anything to anyone. I'm taking just fine. <laughs> So when I say my body belongs to me, it is a revolutionary act to start the conversation by exposing sexual violence because silence and shame are often used to keep women 
quiet. Remember that picture of the woman in Tahrir Square who was being dragged by soldiers and she was stripped down to her blue bra? Unfortunately, her name is Blue Bra Girl because we don't know her name because her family will not let her speak. This woman is a revolutionary hero and they will not let her speak. So we have to break that barrier of silence and shame. And I take it further because I don't want sex to be involved with just violence. I want sex to be associated with the pleasurable thing that it is. And so I insist on talking about sex and how wonderful sex is as that Egyptian, as that African, as that feminist and as that Muslim. And when I do that, when that 32-year-old woman asks me, so how do I get over the guilt? I tell her, I got over the guilt by fucking it out of my system. <laughs> and finally, when I say my body is mine, it is a reminder that the most subversive thing a woman can do is to talk about her life as if it matters, because it does. Thank you.